Okay, good evening. My name is Marsha Moore, and on behalf of the Gateway Science Museum, I am so pleased to welcome you to this, the sixth talk in our seven-part Museum Without Walls lecture series, continuing one more Wednesday night through the end of October with this same virtual format. And you'll notice that my virtual background is again the outside of the museum. We went, went inside for a couple of them and we're back outside. And the main reason is I want to call your attention. I'm not sure if I can see it. I think I'm in the way to that dome, which was part of the design of the museum by the architects who have tried to incorporate a number of features of the natu natural history and natural geology and geography and cultural history of the area. So that dome represents volcanoes, particularly Lassen Peak, which was used as a meeting place and also a wayfinder for the Native Americans who lived here for many years. So that's for me to remind you to use that dome as a wayfinder to find us again once we're open to the public mm -hmm and also to encourage you to find your way to our website, which I know you've already found because you're here, <clears throat> but explore a number of activities that are going on at the museum while we're officially closed. We don't yet know when we'll be open, but hopefully not in the far too distant future. So before proceeding to tonight's presentation, I do want to thank our MWAL committee, our executive director, Adrian McGraw, exhibits curator, Stephanie Parker, and community board member and tonight's speaker, Dr. Rachel Teasdale. We also are extremely appreciative of all of our speakers who are donating their time, talents, and knowledge to the furtherance of teaching and learning about science in our region and beyond. We also do thank our series sponsors, uh, North State Public Radio Station and Renee and John McCamus. And we do acknowledge and are mindful that CSU Chico stands on lands that were originally occupied by the first people of this area, the Machupta. And we recognize their distinctive spiritual relationship with this land and the waters that run through campus. We are humbled that our campus resides upon sacred lands that once sustained the Machupta people for centuries. So we're delighted to welcome tonight's speaker, Dr. Rachel Teasdale, whose talk, Reconstructing the Growth and Destruction of Mount Yana, an ancient volcan volcano of the Cascades, should prove to be quite fascinating. Dr. Teasdale is professor of geological and environmental sciences at CSU Chico, where her areas of research include experimental petrology and volcanology. She received her PhD from the University of Idaho she is the author or co-author of several papers in her specialty. She was executive director of, the, of this Gateway Science Museum in its early days, and for a number of years was on the advisory board of the Chico Science Fair, serving as the board's chair for a time. She is committed to science education, having participated in CSU Chico's hands-on lab for pre-credential teachers and having led summer workshops on teaching geoscience courses and she currently is vice chair of a regional section of the Geological Society of America. And briefly, before Dr. Teasdale begins, I'll remind you that there will be a question and answer session at the end, and we will ask you to use the chat format for your questions. And now, Rachel. Great, thank you, Marsha. That was a really nice introduction, I appreciate it. So I think that you should be able to see my slides now. Um, Marcia, okay, Marsha's nodding, so I assume everybody can. So, um, like Marsha said, I'm going to talk to you about an ancient volcano of the Cascades called Mount Yana. Um, but in doing so, we're going to look at some of the other volcanoes of the Southern Cascades uh, to try and orient ourselves before we dive too deep into a volcano that is not even necessarily very recognizable as a volcano. And this work um, is uh, sponsored by um, a um, group of people um, sponsored by and completed by a group of people who are listed there, um, primarily students in the Department of Geological and Environmental Sciences who have been working on various aspects of this project. Um, also Charles Copeland and um, Mike Klin. Mike is um, from the US Geological Survey and he um, worked in this area a couple decades ago 
and has been generous enough to share what um, great knowledge he has. And um, I must say he has the most amazing memory of any person I've ever met. Um, having worked in this area in the 90s, he walked around like, like he was there last weekend. So it's great. Okay, so um, the three volcanoes that we'll be looking at are Mount Shasta, um, the Lassen Volcanic Center, and we'll be focused on Mount Tehama, um, and then uh, Mount Yana. And those three are shown on this map here to orient you. Chico is down in the valley, um, Red Bluff a little bit north of us. Okay, so Mount Shasta is um, a modern volcano and has the classic um, perfect cone shape, maybe not perfect, but a great cone shape covered with snow on its peaks. And um, a lot of times when I ask students of all ages, um, what do you think of when you think of a volcano? You know, this is the kind of thing that they have in mind. Um, and uh, it's a great um, local uh, landmark and wayfinder, uh, but also a great way to um, visualize a volcano and some of the um, some of the structures associated with volcanoes. Um, slightly less recognizable is Mount Tehama, which um, is no longer visible on the horizon because of massive erosion events that we'll talk about. Um, but folks have tried to reconstruct the approximate um, shape of uh, Mount Tehama and um, it, uh, sort of estimated that it might have been something like 11,500 feet tall. And we know Lassen Peak, um, shown here, um, it's a little bit of a, not, not the perf most perfect clear day on the day this picture was taken, um, but we think of Lassen Peak as, um, you know, one of our local um, gems in the Cascades. And then completely uh, less recognizable would be Mount Yana. And in fact, we don't even have pictures that can show Mount Yana. Um, this is a sketch that was made um, during some early work on Mount Yana. And um, the reconstruction of uh, the peak of Mount Yana is very rough indeed. We, um, I, I did this calculation based on a broad generalization of how steep it might have been and what its footprint might, might have been. And you can tell from the results of my math, somewhere between 11,000 and 14,000 feet, that's quite a range. 14,000 would have been quite a, a high elevation volcano uh, comparable to Mount Shasta. Um, and we're just not certain. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about how we reconstruct the, these elevations um, as we go along. So I want you to keep in mind each of these three volcanoes. Um, each of them are at different stages in the life cycle of um, volcanoes. And, you know, we think of volcanoes as these massive structures, and they are, but they're not permanent. You know, they're permanent in our lifetimes uh, to a certain extent but um, not permanent long term and certainly not in geologic time. So before we start too much into the Cascades, I want to, you know, I'm a geology professor, so I have to give a lecture people and we always have to start with plate tectonics. Okay, so I just want to remind you, um, some of us took fourth grade um, less recently than others. And so um, maybe uh, don't remember all the details about plate tectonics, but the main part that I want to remind you of is that the oceanic lithosphere um, subducts underneath the continental lithosphere, or we can think of the continental uh, plate, the North American plate, rides over the top of the oceanic plate that is subducting down below, okay? The, um, through the process of subduction, um, melt is generated in the mantle above the subducting slab, and that melt is magma, and magma has a, uh, is more buoyant than the solid rock around it, and so that magma rises towards the surface and erupts in volcanic centers, okay, or in lots of different places, but um, as volcanoes. Okay, so in this cartoon diagram of the plate tectonics of um, Western North America, we see the Cascade Volcanic Arc has formed here. I've 
uh, uh, sort of cavalierly labeled Mount Shasta as an example, Mount Rainier as another example further north. Okay. So if we look at a map showing the plate tectonics, we see the um, oceanic plate here. We have subduction going along this sort of um, sawtooth line and the arc of the volcanoes are shown um, in these pink symbols. The main peaks of the, of the sort of um, uh, big noteworthy um, stratovolcanoes are shown by the little triangle symbols. Okay, and you can see some of the labels. Mount Hood is here, um, Mount Rainier here, and the Cascade Arcs goes all the way into the southern part of British Columbia. But what we're going to talk about tonight is the um, Cascade Volcanoes of California. So Shasta, the Lassen Volcanic Center, and Yana. Okay, um, but first let's take some gratuitous eye candy views of these volcanoes of the central Cascades. So we're looking at um, southern Washington and northern Oregon. We see Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier, Adams, Hood in um, northern Oregon, and then Mount Jefferson. And these are all rep these are all sort of representatives of what Mount Tehama and Mount Yana might have looked like um, in their glory days. So when we talk about these volcanoes, keep in mind um, these uh, sort of characteristic uh, volcanoes. We go further south and we see um, Mount Shasta and the Lassen Volcanic Center with Lassen Peak. And of course, um, Mount Tehama would have risen in all its glory high above uh, Lassen Peak, but it is no longer. All right, so we're gonna start with what's most recognizable and we'll take a look at Mount Shasta and then we'll move to the Lassen Volcanic Center and then to Yana. Okay, so another view of Mount Shasta. Um, it's about 14,000 feet tall. It's the youngest and most recognizable and that's why we're starting there and then we'll move to the older volcanoes um, as we go along. So um, the modern edifice of uh, Mount Shasta um, is about 300,000 years old. And so I, I should have noted earlier, um, when you see this KA symbol, KA is for thousands of years ago. So 300 KA would be 300,000 years ago. Um, and then um, more recent eruptions were around 10,000 years ago associated with Shasta and Black Butte. And then the last eruption that we know of, it was about 770 years ago. And um, there were reports by um, one of the Spanish explorers, I can't remember his name now, that there was a more recent eruption, um, but some work has been done to try and figure out where did that eruption occur? Because these guys said they saw it from sea, you know, from the, the um, West Coast um, while they were on their ships. Well, they've reconstructed um, what is most likely to have happened. There are no deposits from um, that time that suggest that there, were, that there was an eruption. So what they think that happened was that um, those uh, Spanish explorers were actually viewing a, um, a wildfire. So, um, you know, the, the smoke may have uh, uh, confused them. So um, the, the most recent eruption that's been confirmed at Mount Shasta was more like 770 years ago. Okay. Um, so Mount Shasta is, has the highest volume of all the volcanoes in the modern Cascades, um, and it was constructed um, by lava flows, by um, pyroclastic ash flows, and um, eros erosive um, aspects of Mount Shasta include debris flows. So this is going to be the theme of what we talk about tonight is um, processes by which these volcanoes um, undergo construction and then the processes by which they're eroded and destructed. Okay. So first of all, I have to say uh, the picture that you're seeing here in the middle is from Kilauea in Hawaii, not from Mount Shasta, um, but I'm using it to demonstrate, to give you a visual of what an active flow, lava flow might look like. Probably there were not um, uh, flows like the one here in, uh, from Kilauea, um, nothing like that at Mount Shasta. Um, but I will tell you that the kinds of lava flows at Mount Shasta are very thick. 
they're um, highly viscous, so they're not very runny like the lava flows at Kilauea volcano. They're so thick that um, they're often like they're really hard to find pictures of these kinds of lava flows um, where they're actually they look like anything is happening. And in fact, a friend of mine told me um, he works on a volcano um, that has these very thick lava flows, and he says that they pretty much have to like look one day, leave and come back, and then they'll notice that change has happened. So that's how slowly um, these kinds of lava flows would be in place. You can see how thick they are. Um, this is the lava park flow from Mount Shasta. Um, you can see it's very thick. Um, it's not going to flow, you know, like um, muddy water would. It's, it's going to flow very slowly. Um, so it's great to use the Kilauea example um, as a visual, but they, uh, the flows of Mount Shasta would have been much slower than this. Okay, another way that um, Mount Shasta was constructed is by pyroclastic flows, or these are um, flows that are made primarily of ash and gas. Okay, so again, I'm showing you a modern version of an eruption of this type. Um, this is from Cinnabung Volcano, and um, th that eruption was in 2015. This is not Shasta. Um, but it's what an eruption of the, this pyroclastic debris might have looked like during an eruption at Mount Shasta. Okay, the picture on the right shows you a deposit of this ash that would have um, erupted from Shasta. And you can see that um, it's, it's very powdery material with some blocks, um, pyroclastic flows, as you can see in the picture at Cinnabon. Um, these eruptions are quite violent and um, they're considered an explosive eruption and they actually, you know, um, erode through the conduit or the main part of the eruption and rip up blocks of the, the actual volcano um, while it's erupting. But the um, net is a growth um, process or a constructive process and we're adding material to the flanks of the volcano. Okay, so this is an, a, one of the other ways that um, Mount Shasta would have undergone construction. In contrast, um, erosion events like debris flows would have contributed to the erosion or the destruction of um, Mount Shasta. So debris flows, as you can see um, at this, from this picture from a debris flow at Santiago, and this uh, shows you that there's a muddy slurry of material um, that is carrying blocks of varying sizes. As the flow um, increases in velocity and energy, it picks up larger blocks and carries those downstream. Um, as the um, energy of the flow decreases, then um, the, the carrying capacity decreases and so those larger blocks get deposited. So um, this is a net loss um, procedure. And so the volcano is actually um, losing material and it's being washed downstream by these debris flows. This is a um, breccia or a, a outcrop of um, rocks that were carried by a um, debris flow um, along Whitney Creek at Mount Shasta. Um, this is a map of Mount Shasta. Um, north is off in this direction. Um, and what you see is Whitney Creek um, is, uh, well, the creek itself is, you know, um, shown in the background, but this blue area shows you an area of Whitney Creek, of the Whitney Creek drainage that was um, eroded uh, during one of these debris flow events, okay? And this map also shows the lava flow that I was talking about. You can see this lobate um, structure here. Um, and then some of the pyroclastic flows, you know, they don't last very long. Um, they're, they're just made of ash. And so um, there's not a lot of outcrops of the pyroclastic flows, but there is one um, right near Reed. Okay. So that's how Mount Shasta um, grew and um, has uh, been undergoing erosion. A big erosion event happened about um, 400,000 years ago, and um, that is uh, how these ridges were deposited, okay? 
So um, you can see they call it the hummocky terrain. And as you drive north on I-5, um, north of Shasta, you see all these little mounds in the distance. And each of those are blocks that actually slid off the um, flanks of Mount Shasta. And nobody really knew what they were um, until not too long ago. Uh, people looked at them, geologists looked at them, and um, they looked at the different layers of rocks that are in these mounds, and they match exactly to the layers of rocks that are found on the flank of the volcano. And nobody could figure out how did this uh, block that has the same exact layering as you know, some other part of the volcano, how did, how did this block get down here? And what happened is in the eruption of Mount St. Helens, uh, people, you know, every, the world was watching, but particularly volcanologists, and they saw these huge blocks slide down the slope of Mount St. Helens. And somebody said, hang on, that's how you get the same layering from the volcano down on the valley down below. And we've seen that before at Mount Shasta. And so, you know, they, they uh, you know, came back and, and looked at the um, layers or the, they call it the stratigraphy of these individual blocks. And each of them could be reconstructed with different parts of the volcano. And so the idea is that around three or 400,000 years ago, we're not sure exactly when, um, there were these massive debris avalanche events where giant chunks of the slope of Mount Shasta literally slid down and um, came to rest in the valley. And there's been plenty of erosion since then, but for the most part, the, um, the layering of the different rock units has remained intact. And so we call it the hummocky terrain. Um, and next time you drive north of Shasta, you'll have to make a point of looking over and seeing these mounds and knowing that each of those mounds used to be up on the flank of the volcano. All right, so, um, oh, and this is, this is a map that shows you. So if this is, you know, it's a very generalized map. If this is approximately Mount Shasta, those hummocky blocks have been mapped all the way up to Montague, um, as far north as Wairika, but not into Wairika. Um, and you can see that, you know, these blocks would have slid down. And so the momentum must have just been tremendous. Um, and I'm not sure if it's associated with an eruption of Mount Shasta. I imagine that it would have been. But um, it's wonderful that we were able to make, not we, me, but we geologists were able to make some observations of um, Mount St. Helens eruption and learn something about the way other volcanoes work. Okay. So if we review the events um, associated with Mount Shasta, we have construction events of um, lava flows and pyroclastic flows. And then we have destructive events like the debris flows um, and then this massive collapse event, okay? One other note on that collapse is if we've observed it at Mount Shasta and we've recognized it, I'm sorry, we've observed it at Mount St. Helens and we've recognized it at Mount Shasta, I suspect that it's happened at lots of other volcanoes where maybe it hasn't been preserved as well. Um, so this is probably a, I don't want to say common event, but an event that happens more commonly than maybe we recognize. And that's one of the joys of um, active processes in geology is um, learning more about, um, you know, things that we thought were so old that there's nothing more to learn. Okay, so let's move south to the Lassen Volcanic Center, and um, we want to look at Mount Tehama, because Mount Tehama is in the next advanced stage of the life cycle of a volcano, and um, it's undergone much more erosion than Mount Shasta, um, but not quite as much as Yana. So uh, just to remind you, we're looking um, towards Lassen Peak, um, we're looking at the reconstructed um, profile of Mount Tehama. Um, Mount Tehama was um, active from about 600,000 years ago until about 400,000 years ago. Um, in contrast, Lassen Peak um, was, uh, is only about 27,000 years old. And of course, 
has um, been active until 1917 um, in the most recent eruption. Um, but Lassen Peak was not around at the time that Mount Tehama would have been active. So Lassen Peak never saw Mount Tehama. Okay, um, Mount Tehama, when it was first being built, it was built inside the um, remnant caldera of a previous volcano um, that had erupted and um, uh, undergone collapse itself. So it might have looked like something like Crater Lake, um, where there's a massive eruption um, and uh, big, um, large amounts of magma are erupted uh, to the point where the volcano is no longer structurally sound. Um, the material inside the volcano has left, and so the flanks of the volcano collapse in. And that's what happened at Crater Lake. So to imagine um, what Mount Tehama would have started as, uh, Crater Lake provides us a good, um, a good visual of that. And of course, Crater Lake is in southern Oregon, and um, you know, one of the one of the many most beautiful Cascade volcanoes. Uh, Mount Mazama is the name of the volcano. Um, we call it Crater Lake now, I guess, as a location or national park, I guess. Okay, so that happened about 600,000 years ago, and then till about 400,000 years ago, um, Mount Tehama eruptions started filling in that ancient caldera. And um, the filling in included lava and ash um, from pyroclastic flows, just like um, what happened at, to build Mount Shasta. Um, so then um, at about 300,000 years ago, um, volcanism at, uh, um, at the Lassen Volcanic Center or, or at Mount Tehama shifted to the north. And so if we look at this park map or a portion of the park map, um, ancient Mount Tehama, the remnants of um, the, the volcano are roughly this blue dashed line, okay? So um, some of the peaks that we know of um, Mount Tehama include Brokoff Mountain, and that's located here. And on the profile picture, Brokoff is here. And then Mount Diller is another um, piece of the remnant of Mount Tehama, and Mount Diller is here. And then we can go around to some of the other peaks. Mount Conard is over here, and that would have been um, part of the rim of, um, of uh, uh, Mount Tehama. Okay, so some of the eruptions that built um, around Mount Tehama would have been Brokoff Mountain. This is, of course, a modern picture of it. Um, and Bumpus Mountain. Um, oh, sorry, Prospect Peak was um, before that, and then Bumpus Mountain. Okay, um, Bumpus Mountain is uh, right here on the rim of what would have been Mount Tehama. And then there was a gap in volcanism um, in this area from um, about 190,000 years ago until about 90,000 years ago. Um, so it's not clear if that is truly a gap in volcanism or if there was volcanism and uh, those materials have been eroded away. Okay, um, it's, it's not clear, but there are no um, indicators. There's no rocks that have been um, dated as falling in to um, that 190 to 90,000 years ago. Um, but then at about 90,000 years, um, new domes were formed. So a dome, I don't think I've mentioned a dome is a um, volcano in and of itself. It has its own magma feeder system, um, but it doesn't generate long lava flows. Generally, the lavas in domes that make up domes are um, very thick, so thick that they don't really flow, they just mound up, okay? And so you can see that the um, slopes of Eagle Peak are fairly steep, um, and that's because instead of lava flowing down the sides of the volcano, the lava mounds up, okay? Um, so that's Eagle Peak, and then another of these Young domes include Lassen Peak, and Lassen, of course, has very um, steep sides. Um, Chaos Crags uh, uh, is a series of domes. Um, this is just one of them. There's, I think, five domes of Chaos Crags, and those erupted a little more than a thousand years ago, so 1.1 thousand years ago. And then, of course, um, at, oops, 
um, uh, Atlassian cinder cone erupted um, at about 1650. Okay, um, and this picture shows um, not just cinder cone and the lava flows that um, erupted out of it, but also Prospect Peak in the background, um, but that's much older. Um, so cinder cone uh, is one of those volcanoes that erupted um, less viscous or more runny lava. And um, so uh, the lava flows emanated away from it and didn't form a big um, steep dome. Now, if you've ever hiked up Cinder Cone, you'll want to argue with me about whether it's steep or not. It certainly feels steep when you're walking up it, but um, not compared to some of the other uh, volcanoes. Okay, so that's sort of the life history of the Lassen Volcanic Center. Um, oh, except, how could I forget? Um, except um, from 1914 to 1917, Lassen Peak was active. And um, many of those uh, eruptions were quite small, especially in the first year between 1914 and 1915. Um, mostly uh, gas was erupted. And then on, um, in May of 1915, um, the culminating eruption, the climatic eruption occurred. And um, of course, that's when um, in one of those eruption, a new lava flow uh, was erupted and then later um, pyroclastic flow and lots of debris flow. And if you visited the devastated area, you'll know that um, there's plenty of destruction of Lassen Peak. Okay, and then Mount Tehama has just been brutalized because not only have there been these debris flows um, and collapse events there, um, there's also been glaciation. So there's been five episodes of glaciation um, since about 37,000 years ago. And geologists like to categorize everything in these ages and, and they're not you know, terribly important other than to realize that um, there has been glaciation at um, Lassen. And um, it's easy to see evidence of this. Um, one very obvious piece of evidence is this giant block sitting um, on the edge next to the parking lot um, if you're hiking to Bumpus Hell. And that rock does not look like it belongs, and it doesn't. It was dragged there by um, a glacier. And so we call it erratic because um, it doesn't belong where it's now deposited. So imagine a glacier moving um, that rock. And then as the glacier um, uh, melted, it wasn't, uh, that, that block was deposited. Um, and you, you can see other evidence of glaciation throughout the park. Um, and that's one of the physical processes by which the volcano has been eroded. Um, the arrows on this map um, show other uh, places where we find evidence of glaciation. So we see uh, maybe not as impressive big blocks like this um, having been moved by glaciers, um, but you can see that from a high old area, um, the glaciers have um, uh, deposited material sort of radiating from what would have been um, you know, the, the peak. And then the last form of, ero of erosion that I want to talk about is hydrothermal um, alteration. So um, if you visited um, the park, then you have probably driven past um, Sulphur Works, which is shown in the two pictures on the right here. Um, Sulphur Works is one of many areas of, um, one of many hydrothermal areas, and hydro means uh, water and thermal means heated. So we know that we have heated water. Um, what happens is snow and um, rainfall, any kind of precipitation percolates down into the subsurface where it mixes with um, hot fluids that are also acidic. And then that water percol or, uh, um, uh, sorry, circulates back up towards the surface and um, uh, will um, form things like this um, mud pot at Sulphur Works. There's another one um, on the other side of the road. And um, in doing so, it's bringing this acidic fluid to the surface. And so you see that um, these areas um, are discolored um, with um, reds and orange and, and yellows. And that is the product of chemical alteration. So the um, acidic water chemically reacts with the lava and um, actually turns some of the minerals in the lavas into clay. 
And so um, clay is very soft and um, um, erodible. And so uh, this chemical erosion or this chemical alteration softens the rocks. So any other kind of physical erosion, like a glacier or even just rainfall, is um, very has a very easy time eroding away the material from the volcano. So Mount Tehama kind of got the one-two punch. It got hydrothermally altered um, from the inside and then um, uh, eroded with physical processes like glaciers and snow and, and runoff um, on the physical side. Okay, so here's another test from fourth grade. Um, uh, well, let's see, is it a test? No, it's not a test yet. The test is coming, I'm, I'll warn you. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about how we reconstructed Mount Tehama because that's instrumental to how we um, uh, will attempt to reconstruct Mount Yana. Um, so what we can do is look at um, a sketch like this, um, and what we see is the reconstruction already completed. But in order to do that, what, um, what we can do is look at the orientation of the rock units that are still present. So these lava flows have an orientation that tells us uh, something about the flanks of the volcano um, while it was still, um, you know, full grown. Um, and so if we use those orientations, we can project those dip angles up towards the center point and um, create an estimate for what the elevation of the volcano might have been. So um, that's how they did it, and they figured out that it was about 3,500 um, meters or maybe 11,500 feet. And um, uh, this person who um, created uh, this diagram suggested that there was also some kind of um, crater or caldera. Um, that There's less evidence for that, that's more interpretive, um, but the method for reconstructing the elevation um, is, is sound. Okay, so I told you that this is the um, remnant uh, rim of Mount Tehama, and we have some peaks that help us outline that rim. Um, when we project those, the angle of the dipping beds um, away from the volcano, instead of towards the peak away from it, um, then we can project what the footprint might have been. And so the footprint of um, ancient Mount Tehama might have been um, approximately what this um, uh, solid blue circle is showing you. So something like 17 kilometers across or, or 10 miles. So that might have been the footprint of Mount Tehama. Okay, so these are all ways that we can reconstruct um, these ancient volcanoes. Now's the test. Now's the test about the Lassen Volcanic Center. We can't walk away from Lassen Volcanic Center without uh, celebrating the big four. Okay, so there are four. When I teach intro geology, I teach my intro students that there are four basic kinds of volcanoes a stratovolcano, a shield volcano, domes, and cinder cones. And we have all four at the Lassen Volcanic Center. And I want to test you. Oh, you guys are muted. You can't take the test. Well, I'm sure you all would have passed with flying colors. The uh, actual peaks of each of these are shown in blue, and these are just examples. Our strato volcano would have been Mount Tehama. Shield volcano would have been Prospect Peak, and we can see just the flank of Prospect Peak here um, in this picture. Um, Lassen Peak or the Chaos Crags are examples of our domes. And then of course, the Cinder Cone is aptly named as a Cinder Cone. So there we go. Um, this is celebrated in the national park system. Uh, they claim they're the only national park that have all of the big four. And it's right here in our backyard and um, easy to get to. Okay, so just to reconstruct um, our constructional events at Mount Tama would have been the lavas and the pyroclastic flows, the domes, the shield volcanoes and the cinder cones. And our destructive events would have been debris flows, the hydrothermal alteration, which would have called, uh, caused that chemical alteration, and then glacial um, erosion. So um, again, uh, we're able to reconstruct um, more information about uh, the volcano, even though it's no longer present. 
Okay, so let's head south and um, even closer to home is Mount Yana. Um, Yana would have been just west of Lake Almanor, um, south and slightly east of the Lassen Volcanic Center. Um, so it's in this area here, it's even harder to visualize because it's even older and more eroded. So now we're in the millions of years range, so about three and a half to two and a half million years ago. So this is an image um, or a collection of images uh, taken from Mount Yana, looking to the north towards what would have been Mount Tehama. So we've got the reconstruction of Mount Tehama here, and um, I went ahead and um, tried to reconstruct what would have been the caldera wall of uh, Mount Yana. And um, there's my estimate of what could have been the flank of the volcano, um, somewhere between 11,000 and 14,000 feet, depending on what slope you use and what footprint you use. Okay, so we know that volcanoes are um, constructed of lava flows and pyroclastic layers, and I'll tell you about the um, dikes in just a minute. Um, so let's take a look at um, Mount Tehama. This is becoming an app. We are creating a geologic tour into a volcano. And so um, the work that I'm about to tell you about is the product of, um, of that, or is uh, in order to create that app. Okay, so we have some stops um, in the Tuscan Formation on the way to uh, the Yana Volcanic Center along Highway 32, but I'm gonna stay right in um, Yana and keep us um, in, in the uh, little hike that we've developed along um, this ridge here. But first I'm gonna take a quick detour um, because there are a couple of things that we just discovered this summer that are not part of the app, maybe they'll become part of the app, um, but do tell us a bit about how Mount Yana would have been constructed. So um, obviously we're looking at very ancient domes here. And um, what we didn't realize until we actually went there is that there probably were some domes at Mount Yana, um, just like there were um, at Mount Tehama. And so what you're looking at is probably one of the domes here. It's now very eroded. And then we think there's another dome here, and there may be even more. Um, if we look at the rocks that are at this dome, that's what the picture on the right is, and the lavas here are just like picture-perfect dome material. And so um, we, we didn't realize this um, when we first started working there, but now we're thinking that um, it makes sense that uh, domes would have been part of the constructive events of um, Mount Yana. Okay, and if we really want to arm wave, because who was there three million years ago to argue with us, we, we could go dome crazy. And um, this is um, one of the ones we were just looking at, and another one here. Um, is it possible that all of these bare areas are domes? I don't know, we haven't checked everything yet, um, but we could go real crazy waving our arms, um, speculating. Uh, instead, we'll do some more work and have an update for you in maybe at the end of next summer. Okay, lava flows are um, on our app tour. Um, we know that um, this is part of the constructive process of building a volcano. So um, if, if you're doing our um, hike along the app, you'll get to stop seven and you'll see this wide lava flow um, that uh, would have helped to construct the volcano. We can look at the actual lava rocks. Um, they're very similar to what you might see at Lassen Peak um, or at other areas in the Lassen Volcanic Center. Um, and it makes sense that, the, um, that there would be similarities. I mentioned that um, in addition to lava flows, there were probably pyroclastic layers. We've not found any of these, um, but three million years ago in an area that would have been heavily glaciated, we're not surprised that we haven't found those yet. Um, maybe we will, maybe they're eroded away, we're not sure. Another part of building the volcano though is um, this idea of radiating dikes. So dikes are the system by which magma is delivered to the surface. And that can happen through the main conduit of the volcano, or dikes can um, deliver magma from you know, other areas of the volcano and can um, show uh, uh, or bring that magma to um, side uh, or eruptions on the side of the volcano. 
So again, if we look at um, our example of Crater Lake, um, if you go out on um, the boat tour on Crater Lake, you can look at the interior of Mount Mizama. Okay, and you'll see these planar features and these are dikes. So this is how magma was uh, delivered to the edifice of uh, Mount Mizama at Crater Lake. We see something very similar at Mount Yana. We see these long planar ridges um, made of um, solid lava material. And um, we often can, um, here's another view of the planar ridge that looks maybe more like the one I showed you at Crater Lake. And um, sometimes they have these very interesting cooling joints um, that tells us that they cooled near the surface. So these weren't buried um, um, at depth in the volcano. Um, and we can see another example of a dike here. It's the um, yellowy part that would have intruded through this rock unit. And sometimes we get lucky and we can see the dike material here, the material, the rock that it intruded into, and then we see this glassy margin in between. And that glassy margin tells us that the dike was very hot it froze against the very cold material. And so it created this outer glassy rim that would have insulated the magma inside the dike as it was erupting or moving towards the surface. So all kinds of crazy stuff that we can figure out. We also have destructive events at Mount Yana. In fact, we see a lot of these. Um, we have debris flows. Um, this is a picture of one of the debris flows that you would see um, on the hike if you were to follow our app through Mount Yana. You can see individual clasts that were carried by the um, debris flow. Here's some of the muddy matrix that would have um, uh, sort of been the driving mechanism. Here's another debris flow. You can see Evan here for scale. And all of these are, um, you know, this would have been one or two maybe debris flows that would have been flowing down the flank of the volcano. In this particular debris flow, we find scoria clasts. And so we're um, hypothesizing that the scoria could have come from a cinder cone, like cinder cone at Lassen Peak or at Lassen Volcanic Center. And if there was a cinder cone there, then that tells us that there would have been different compositions that would have been erupted. The cinder cone's long gone, or at least we haven't found it yet, but we see evidence of it in the material contained within the debris flow. Um, in this stop, we see um, where a debris flow um, is in contact with or overlying a lava flow. And so we get to see constructive events of the lava flow buried by the debris flow, but some later erosion, erosive event um, exposed this so that we could see it. And then um, another thing that we've been able to reconstruct at Mount Yana is um, taken from this outcrop. So here we have basaltic lava, okay, that would have erupted, but underneath that basaltic lava is a material, um, it's made up of sandy fragments of that basalt. And then some of the fragments are even bigger. And this process, um, or this um, type of outcrop, is formed when um, basalt or hot lava erupts through ice and snow. We'll go figure, An, a beautiful icy, snowy, covered peak like a Cascade volcano might have had an eruption during um, the winter and would have erupted, the magma would have erupted through the snow and ice, which would have caused the magma to um, fracture and sort of pulverize. And that's what makes up this yellowy material. And then as the magma got through the snow and ice, then it would have um, erupted and flowed um, across the landscape or it would have melted the snow and ice and then um, flowed over that melted um, terrain. Okay, the other reason that the Yana Volcanic Center is important to us is because it makes up the ridges of um, uh, 
the buttes around Butte College, the ridges um, along Highway 32, except it's no longer called Mount Yana because these are all debris flows that flowed from Mount Yana down into the valley. So this is a view looking across um, Upper Bidwell Park. You can see um, different layers of debris flows and um, even like a, like a high plane um, along the surface of one of those debris flows. And they would have um, eroded Mount Yana and literally brought Mount Yana into the valley. So all we have to do is examine every single one of these rocks and we'll be able to reconstruct this beautiful, you know, potentially 13, 14,000 foot peak um, and, and know more about it. I doubt that's going to happen, um, but, you know, I'm sure somebody will work on it someday. The other importance about the Tuscan formation, which eroded from Mount Yana, is that um, once the rocks are in the subsurface in our valley, um, they form the um, aquifer. So water um, that we use in the valley is stored in the rocks of the Tuscan formation um, beneath our feet. So um, there's another important part of Mount Yana. But to summarize, Mount Yana are constructional events that we've been able to figure out. Our lavas, potentially pyroclastic flows, we should put a question mark there, we're still looking. Um, we uh, potentially have cinder cones and certainly domes. Um, the erosion events would have been debris flows, um, all kinds of uh, glacial related erosion. Um, the hydrothermal alteration comes from the idea of um, the uh, hot um, magma erupting through ice, and that would have caused the same kind of chemical alteration that we saw at Mount Tehama. Perhaps a collapse event, we're still working to understand that as well. So just in, to recap, our oldest, our grandmother volcano is Mount Yana. Our mama volcano is Mount Tehama. And our baby volcano is Mount Shasta. Um, so with these three, we um, get to see the lifespan or the life cycle, I shouldn't say lifespan, life cycle of a volcano all right here in Northern California. So with that, I'd be happy to answer as many questions as I can. And I believe that somebody is monitoring the chat. I have not been watching that. So I, I don't I know. Yeah, I was and you did. Everybody a chance to regroup. Marsha, go ahead. Sorry. No, I, I did put in in the chat while people are uh, doing this. Two things. One, uh, who named Mount Yana and is there a meaning to it? Um, I don't know who named Mount Yana. Um, there's certainly a meaning to it in terms of um, the Native American um, uh, civilizations, um, tribes, I guess, um, that were in the area. Um, I don't know who actually named it, um, but uh, yeah, sorry, I don't know the answer to that. But okay. more and for the app, right? A little more scientific, yeah. Um, could you just talk a little bit about the dating of the volcanoes, the lava flow, the debris flow? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so lava flows are um, generally pretty easy to get ages from. We can um, use isotope dating methods to, um, to get the age that the, the minerals that are in the lava flows, the age that they crystallized. So that would be the age that the magma turned from molten material to solid material. So um, those, those tell us pretty clearly um, about the age of those eruptions. The debris flow ages are really hard because those debris flows are made up of clasts, fragments of lava flows. So if we try to get ages of the um, of the crystals that are in the clasts, that just tells us when the eruption originally happened. It doesn't tell us anything about how long that lava flow sat around on the surface, a million years, a thousand years, 10 years um, before the debris flow happened. So the debris flow um, ages are um, relative ages. That means that if we have a lava flow and a debris flow on top of it, we know that that debris flow was um, younger than the lava flow. If we're lucky and have another lava flow on top of that debris flow, then we have a debris flow sandwich. And so we can say, well, the debris flow must be 
um, younger than the lower lava and older than the upper lava, but it's really just a relative age. So that's one of the things that's pretty tough. Occasionally we'll get lucky and maybe find some kind of charcoal or something that can be dated. Mm -hmm. um, that has not happened to my knowledge at Yana, but um, that did happen at Lassen. So, um, you know, it's, it's happened, um, just not at Yana so far. Great. Rachel, this is a related question. Um, it sounds like you're saying the ridges above Upper Bidwell Park are the most ready rock source of mapping Mount Yana? Well, they, they are, um, those, those uh, ridges are the eroded remnants of Mount Yana. So when Mount Yana eroded away, those debris flows that flowed into the valley um, and became the, what we call the Tuscan Formation, those are actually clasps of, um, of Mount Yana's lavas. So um, yes, we can look at those and try and um, uh, understand a bit about Mount Yana, um, but really uh, uh, looking closer to the volcano, like in the area that I was showing you guys about the app, um, that area is probably going to be more, um, we're going to learn more closer to the volcano than, than further afield. Another question, is our aquifer storing water in the debris flow from Mount Yana? Yes, it is. Um, they're, they're, the, the debris flows, you know, they're very, um, the clasps in the debris flows are big, um, close to the, the volcano. And then, um, you know, as they remember, I talked about the carrying capacity of the water, you know, as it reaches into the valley, um, we get onto um, flatter land. And so the water slows down, it's less energetic. So it's no longer carrying those giant clasps. Um, but in, um, so in the valley where the aquifer is, the individual fragments of the Tuscan formation, which are um, remnants of the, the debris flows, um, the Tuscan formation has much smaller clasps and the water um, percolates down and is stored in the pore spaces um, between the clasps uh, in, the, in the aquifer. Rachel, you're getting a lot of new fans of uh, Lassen, so I think people are going to take some trips up there. That's um, excellent coming out in the chat. Uh, Dave Shlom reminds us that um, Yana and Maidu were the names of indigenous people who lived in this region. Thank you. Yes. And um, I don't see any other direct questions yet. Any others? Dave's been adding some facts along the way, which is great. Excellent. Anything else from anyone? Well, I hope that you will watch. We'll be getting the word out as the app um, becomes a real thing. We have a beta version that we're field testing and um, you know, once it's uh, viable, we'll um, make sure that we get the word out as best we can. In a, in a cool twist, um, some of students at Chico State in the public relations course are helping us with getting the word out. So this is becoming a cross-campus effort from the geology students, the computer science students, and the PR students. Um, so we'll, we'll try and get the word out and maybe um, get Gateway to help with that too, so. I do see a couple of questions that have oh. come up. I don't know, Adrian. Uh, Dave asks, is the Volcanic Center migrating north? Uh, is the Volcanic Center migrating north? Um, not With the that tectonic I mean... plates, maybe? Oh, okay, yeah. So, yes. So the North American plate is rotating. Um, we see this especially um, in the Central Cascades um, where, uh, yeah, the, the plate is rotating um, so that it, you know, in millions of years, we might see some northward progression. Um, maybe it's not even millions, maybe hundreds of thousands of years, something like that, um, but Faster. ever so slightly, yes. Okay, and one more question from uh, Dave Keller. Any leftover hot springs in the Mount Yana area? Oh, Dave Keller and those hot springs. <laughs> um, I, 
I have not found any um, in the Yana area. I suspect they they may be there, but I honestly, I, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised, but I have not found any myself. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, Jean asks, why are Tuscan class so uniform in composition when you'd expect more variety similar to Lassen? Ah, yeah. Um, so a couple thoughts. First of all, I don't know, but I will try to give an answer in spite of that. Um, uh, a couple thoughts are that perhaps the lava flows that are on the side of the volcano that eroded towards the um, uh, you know, Chico area, um, perhaps those were more uniform in composition. Um, and the other idea that I have is that they're not actually uniform in composition. And I have a student who worked on some of those clasts. They're not all the same. They're very similar though. So um, for you geology geeks, they uh, tend to be andesite in composition, but um, we've found, um, I think it was five or six different types of andesite. So generally similar, but not exact. So Rachel, thank you very, very much. It was even more fascinating than I thought it would be. It was great. <laughs> and, uh, and it was actually Rachel's idea also, as long as many of us are not traveling distances, to talk about things in our backyard. And now we will have so much greater appreciation for what's in our backyard and front yard. And so I am going to, this is not because Halloween is coming up, but to remind you that next week we will have Dr. Troy Klein talking about development of vaccines. So we will look forward to seeing you in a week. And Adrian, you want to take us out? Yeah, just thank you again, Rachel. Um, I am so excited to take a trip up there soon. Uh, just a reminder that uh, Gateway Science Museum is closed, but we're still um, putting out great programs for the public and for schools. And if you are interested in making a donation, I have put the link to our donation portal in the chat. And every dollar really counts at this point. So um, thank you for supporting us in all the ways that you do.